Hey, and particularly when it's up in Minnesota, because no one's going to go to Minneapolis if they don't have to in the dead of winter. Uh, but you miss, I miss that interchange. I was in college ball for 10 years. Uh, I started out, just so you know my reference point, so that we'll talk about tonight gives you a chance to, for, for me to communicate to you that this is applicable across the board, whether you're a high school or college coach. Uh, I've coached high school ball. I've coached small college, NA, NAI division, uh, lower division 1A, one, uh, one upper division 1A, and in the NFL. And uh, I can guarantee you, football is football. The fundamentals of what you're going through now, you're to be commended for being here in the first place because a lot of your peers aren't. And this is, this is the type of thing I know when I was coming up in the ranks and uh, my early years in coaching really made a difference because that's where you can get a good interchange of ideas. Even if it's not wholly within the philosophy of what you're doing, there's always a different way to approach something. Even if it's not fundamentally in alignment with what you're doing, there might be just one or two things you can take from a clinic like this, whether it's just the way you approach it or a certain way that you verbalize it to your athlete that can make a difference. Now, I always get in a little bit of a quandary as to what to talk about when I come and talk to you about a clinic because a lot of you are coming from a lot of different systems. And a lot of things that we're doing, particularly in the NFL, may or may not apply to what you're doing based on the caliber of the athlete that you're dealing with, obviously, as compared to what we're dealing with. But there's one thing that always does come to mind. You know, a lot of times I've been asked to talk because of my background. I spent a number of years with Bill Walsh when he first took over with the 49ers. That's where Coach Green and I hooked up together. I've worked within and taught that, for lack of a better term, that West Coast or Bill Walsh offense for a number of years. And whenever I've gone in and talked to a group, whether it be a clinic or they've had me individually to talk to their staff, I always felt like when they wanted to talk about that type of offense, that they came away or came out of the experience a little disappointed. Because when you look at it and you look at the route combinations or the protections or blocking schemes, you come away going, well, gee, you know, they, I don't know whether they expected this some type of mystical combinations that no one else runs or this new, innovative, unique way of approaching the game. And that's not the case. A lot of it are the exact same things that you're doing. A lot of it are the same things I was doing back in, in the late 70s at BYU, where I graduated from. Base football is base football. I've had the good fortune in my career, and I call it that because it's nothing that you can really design to say, I'm going to work for this guy or I'm going to work with that guy. But I've been really fortunate starting out as a player in the NFL and then, and then hooking on with some other coaches to work with guys like Denny Green, Bill Walsh. Uh, on that staff was Bruce Coslett, Sam Weish, uh, John Ralston. Uh, my days with the Cowboys when Coach Landry was there, Don, or, uh, Dan Reeves and Mike Ditka. Uh, Coach Edwards at BYU, Coach Scoville, who was kind of a mentor of mine through BYU and the Cincinnati Bengals and the San Francisco 49ers. And the thing that, uh, they obviously you're talking about a number of different individuals with a lot of different approaches to the game and a lot of different personalities. But there was a certain common thread that came through it. And what I want to talk about now is not just game plan structure and, and what plays we run. And later on this, after, this evening after dinner, for anybody that's still here, we can talk about some of the specific fundamentals uh, within the route package that we run. But what I want to talk about now is something that I believe in, and again, given the background I've had and the people I've worked with, is something I believe in as firmly and as passionately as anything I've ever learned, whether it's the absolute fundamentals of the game, physical fundamentals, whether it's blocking techniques or route combinations, the way that you approach setting up your game plan and the larger picture of setting up uh, the way you install an offense and install it from a training camp standpoint to a weekly game preparation to actually call it in the game is as important as anything that I've learned collectively from this group of individuals. And, and a lot, to be, honest, be, be very honest with you, came from Bill Walsh's philosophies. Regardless of what you think of him as an individual or what he has done or what he hasn't done, uh, you've got to give the devil his due. He's been successful. And with the system that he did it with, the bottom line was the focus and specificity that he brought to his preparation. Again, I could put up every schematic of every play we ran with the 49ers and again at Stanford and now with the Minnesota Vikings, and you would look up there and say, well, that's all well and good, but you know, that's just base football. We, we all run that curl, curl out, and yeah, we all run the zone technique, and yeah, the counter's the counter and the trap's the trap. But it's the focus that Coach Walsh, and I believe went back to his early days uh, with Coach Brown when he was with the Cincinnati Bengals, that really set the tenure for what I think was the best of, of what Bill Walsh did. Uh, and again, I don't begin to speak for Bill Walsh. Again, this is obviously filtered through a number of different years. But let's just start with the, the overall standpoint. You're going to have
a basic offense. I don't know if this bank of likes so maybe turn down a little bit, Coach, so they can see the, uh, the overlay a little bit better. But like everybody, you're going to have a base offense. Okay, now that doesn't, it doesn't make any difference whether you believe in the split back veer, whether you believe in the power eye, whether you want to throw the ball uh, 80 to 90% of the time. Whatever your offensive philosophy is going to be, it's going to be what it is. Now you go into a game and you're going to take bits and pieces of that offense and it's going to move around within the body of what you do as a whole. Obviously you can't take an entire offense into a, a weekly game plan. That's fine coach, I don't need any more light, that's great. Okay, so you're going to take your game, your specific game plan, and from week to week, it's going to move around within the body of your entire offense. Now, once you get that game plan implemented, you're going to have the actual game, the game script. And ideally, this game script will fall within the body of your offense and with the body of what you've put together that week. And a perfect game plan is going to fit just like that. Now, we also know this is not a perfect world. More often than not, regardless of how successful you are, a game plan will a lot of times maybe overlap like that. You've got certain basic precepts of your game, of your offense, that maybe you didn't think were going to be important this week or weren't going to be viable based on the level of uh, your opponent or what you'd planned on what they did defensively. But occasionally you get into the game and you go, gosh, I know we didn't practice it much this week, but the trap would have really been good. Or let's run that sprint out with the throwback to the Z. That's going to be, you know, the way their corner's playing or whatever it may be. Now, occasionally, it overlaps like that because whatever you plan for the week, it ain't working. Whether you didn't play well or plan well, the players aren't playing well, you got to start grabbing shit out of your ass because what you planned on isn't going. And occasionally, we've all been in games like this. Where it's going so bad, it's, I know we've never done it, and I know it's not in the offense, but God, man, we got to do something. So let's do this, okay? Obviously, game plans like that you want to stay away from. But if there's, a, if there's a base premise that, and again, I don't mean to, to bring up his name in that fashion, but I think he does represent a certain focus to what I'm talking about, that Bill Walsh's philosophies are to bring as much focus to a specific game plan as you can. Now, why and, and how do you do that? And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to throw some numbers at you. I'm going to throw some statistics. I'm, I'm a little bit into computers. I'm one of those new age coaches that does a lot on the computers. And that, sometimes that's a misnomer. Sometimes I think coaches that know coaches that do that think they sit in front of that thing nine hours a day and throw in game plans and this magic comes out. That's not the case. Computers are like they are in any profession. It's a way to help you stay more organized and be more proficient in what you're doing. But I'm going to throw some numbers out at you here. And again, it's something I believe in as strongly as anything I've ever done. Uh, afterwards, don't ask me for a copy of it because I'm not going to give it to you. If you're going to learn it, you're going to sit and you're going to write it down. I promise you. I promise you if you'll take the time to write down some of the things that I'm going to put up here, and, that, and I'll try to highlight those things for you so it's not like you've got to uh, hang on every word I have to say. But I think there's some things that if you give some considered thought to will help you. Now, in terms of game planning, or and I'll bring it even more focused to sequenced openers, and we'll talk a little bit later on about the, the magical 25 openers. That seems to be a question that most people ask me. Well, how do you do that? How can you be that specific and sequence your 25 openers when you don't know what the first play is going to do, or the second, or the gain, or what, what the actual sequencing in the game is going to be? And I think I can show you with some specifics as to what we're talking about and how it can apply to what you're doing regardless of the style of the offense that you're doing, okay? Now, a couple base precepts that you've got to accept in this. One, decisions made in the cool and calm of your office during the week after thorough opponent analysis, always much sounder than trying to pull something out of your hat on game day, okay? You have got to be focused with what you're going to do in terms of attacking a defense. We all know, and anybody in here that has called plays, know that there is no more pressured situation than that game clock clicking off and you trying to figure out what it is I'm going to run and what I should do at this time. The cool, calm, collective analysis that you do during the week, hopefully with the collective efforts of your coaching staff, can prepare you for virtually every situation that's going to come up. And 99 times out of 100, I promise you that that calculated choice is going to be better than pulling something out. I spend a great deal of time in the offseason analyzing what we do 
analyzing our base situations, what's run, what was calculated to run, what was actually run, and then there's always the miscellaneous stuff, a new play from the outside. This looks good. I saw someone do this, so I'm going to put this in. Or you called something you saw on game day, and boy, if we did this, okay, I'm going to go off script, I'm going to call that. And the amount of success with the miscellaneous stuff, and I'm talking over a 15-year period now, coaches, never matches up to that which was calculated during the week, decided on as a staff that was going to be the most effective, was scripted, practiced, and run in that situation, had nowhere near the success ratio as the ancillary stuff that you have to put into a degree. Now, by way of that, we're also talking about what that does is it allows you versatility without having to deal with a large number of unruly or a large or unruly number of different plays. Many times people make the mistake of thinking that having a big offense or a multiple offense that attacks in multiple ways has to be this big. And now it's bigger than you can comprehend. It's bigger than you can impart on your players. But that's not the case. If you can bring specific focus to a situation, whether it's open field first down, second down, nickel, whether it's red zone openers, whether it's plus 10 offense, whether it's goal line, whether it's backed up, if you will bring specific analysis to those situations, you can now script for yourself as large a looking at offense as you want, whether it's a number of plays, whether it's a number of formations. And by bringing that focus to specific situations, it's not that large. Now, if you're trying to bring an offense that is multiple in both what you're running and formations and attack, and taking all of that offense into each situation, each situation, open field is the same as red zone, is the same as plus 10, now you're talking about an offense that's too large for me to comprehend. By uh, isolating situations you, uh, you, you will be in and determine what will be the best chance for success. During the week, you all spend countless, countless hours looking at film, determining what it is that defense is going to do. If you've played this guy, as many of you will, within your own conferences or divisions, a number of times you get to feel a book on this coach or that co coach, what he likes to do when he likes to blitz. Uh, when he really comes into a man package versus zone package in the red zone, you get a feel for him. Use that analysis during the week. Decide what are the best way to attack what you know he's going to do, and be very focused on the best way to attack that. Now, that sounds like common sense. Well, what else are you going to do, coach? But as we get into the numbers, I think you can see, and as you get into self-analysis, you can find where maybe you're having some overlap or way, maybe you're having some wasted uh, time here that you could use in a better way. Determine the pass-run ratio you think is needed to win. Once you've established those situations and what you want to get done, if you believe in the pass game, if you believe in the run game, if you believe in balance, whatever it is, you take what's in your offense, you decide what's best for that situation based on what the defense does, and you, just, and you make your mind up during the calm of the week, you practice those situations so the players know what to expect by situation, and you live with it as opposed to saying, well, on game day, I'll decide on third and three if I'm going to run or throw. Third and three, interesting down and distance situation. I can show you 15 years of data. A true third and three, open field, probably one of the hardest situations, just long enough. Maybe I can get it run. Maybe I can pass it. Do I want to play action? It's tough on the defense to get a book on you because you could go either one as opposed to a true nickel, as opposed to a third and one. And I've seen game plan after game plan where coaches go in with a third and three or third and two to three offense, and they got eight plays for third and three. We'll do this, and then this, and then this, and then this. Okay? You're going to be in the open field in a true third and three one time a game, period. One. If you double that and break the odds, <coughs> twice. Okay? Why do you need eight, ten plays for a situation you're going to be in one time if you'll do your homework, recognize what this coach likes to do in that situation, match up the best thing that you do, and now the players know and can expect in that situation what's coming. They have the confidence that they've run it and that you've got something for that situation and that they can implement it on game day. It gives the coaches <coughs> focus as to what is being run and what to watch for. One of the most integral things we do at my level is to utilize your talent. Okay? Coach Green is not one to inject himself into the offense a great deal. But if it's third and five, and Steve Jordan or Chris Carter are standing on the sideline next to me, on Monday I'm going to get one of these from Coach Green. And it's going to be why in a crucial point of the game were your two best players on the sideline? 
Okay? I know you may think you're a good coach, but games are won by athletes, and I want my best athletes on the field. It goes likewise for your coaching staff. I know a lot of you probably, whether you're head coaches or assistant coaches, feel like you've got some pretty good coaches. We had last year Tom Moore, who's 13 years in the league, two Super Bowls with the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. We had Dick Corey, who's been in the league for about 17 years, been a coordinator with the Rams, with the New England Patriots. Uh, we had John Michaels, who was our line coach, 26 years in the NFL with the Minnesota Vikings coaching the offensive line. That's a lot of experience. It would have been ridiculous for me to go into game plan preparation and exclude those individuals from what we're doing, thinking that I have the answers, or worse yet, get to game day, and with all the pressures going on and the clock going out and the fans are yelling and your ass is on the line, to think that I more readily will have an answer and can see more than these individuals collectively. I call the plays from the sideline, not unlike a lot of you, particularly in high school. A lot of coordinators go up in the booth, but it doesn't make sense to me as a coordinator whose job is to do just that, coordinate the different elements of an offense to get the play called, and therefore if I do it from the box, I've now got these gentlemen who've got a tremendous amount of experience, usually on the field, picking their nose. Because as you know, you can't see much from the field level and there's only so much interchange you can get from that position. I would much rather have that experience up in the box looking at what they are specifically slotted to look at and then communicate to me, not just haphazardly run the trap, run the counter, run this pass, run that pass, but by, by being intricately involved in the game plan, knowing specifically what's being called next by situation, that they can then have the input that if we've got this run play, that run play, and the third run play up in base offense on first down is going to be a counter, and my line coach doesn't have to guess that's what I'm going to call, he can watch the point of attack leading up to that time, and if he feels the need to then come to me in between series and say, Coach, I know the next run up for you is going to be the counter, but I don't think it's going to work because we're not getting enough push by the tackle and the tight end. Or we can't run the zone because the backside guard and center aren't scooping up into that weak side linebacker because he knows what's coming, he's been made part of that decision, and now that's, an, that's a very calculated, analytical way to change a play as opposed to what normally happens is you run the counter. Coach, I, you know, I knew the counter wasn't going to work. Well, you might have told me that before I called it. might have helped a little bit. But the only way you can implement that is for them to be integrally in par, a part of the game planning and to know within reasonable amount what's going to come next in the play calling. Okay, having that kind of specific focus also clues your quarterback in and provides a real easy rhythm for the game. It's very important, at least at our level, that there's a natural rhythm to the game. The players are coming out, in and out efficiently. The quarterback is anticipating what's being called next. He knows by personnel formation what plays that's going to go with. He's got a nice natural flow. Things are coming out evenly. You've got control of the line of scrimmage if you want to screw around with the audible count or the uh, hard count and trying to draw them off sides. Everything flows smoother. There's a great deal of confidence that goes with that. But it only comes with them not only knowing what plays are in the offense, but what sequencing they can ex expect. It allows you to make full use of formations and personnel. If you're like me, initially you come in and you go, I want to do this. We're going to run this play by this formation, this formation, this formation. You get into the heat of the battle, and all of a sudden it gets shrunk down into a very set pattern that you're used to doing. And it is that set pattern because you're successful with it. You come back to the things that you know you do best. But all week long you said, we've done this so much out of this formation, I really think this play would be a nice counter to that because they're going to be so focused in on this that we'll do that. But in the heat of battle, it's hard to come back to that unless you've got it specifically scripted for a situation. One of these further down in here, uh, in your openers, if it's loud, you know, it makes you successful. There's a lot of confidence. I'm not very good about specials. It allows you to script specific special plays or specific plays to specific individuals. I'm not much one for gadgets, but there are a place for gadgets. And typically, I would start out and say, okay, we're going to have this reverse, and we'll have this reverse pass. Okay, those are my two gadget plays this week. And you practice it. And you say, yeah, I want to get these called because I think it can hurt them. And game after game after game goes, and it doesn't get run. And I found that if you really believe in it, You've got to isolate when is the reverse pass going to be good. Is it first possession, all of a sudden they get a fumble or, or an interception and you're on their side of the 50? If it's the second or third first down, 
in a series because you've lulled them to sleep a little bit. You're so totally a neglected special plays that you're going to open the game with it. But if you can give kind of specific focus as to when you want to run that play, it will get run. Now, whether you don't want to run it or whether you want to run it, that has to be decided during the week and try to pick your spot for it. The bottom line, and Bill Walsh will tell you this, this is the number one thing he'll tell you time in and time out, you've got to live by the written word. I'll promise you, if you do your homework and you analyze an opponent properly and you'll stick by your script, that the amount of success you'll have uh, is exponential compared to all of a sudden you going offline, you going off script thinking that you know something. Think about it. How many times have you gone into a game where an opponent has been 180 degrees opposite of what you expected and maintain that through the course of the game. Now, they may come out and give you a new wrinkle, a new front, a new coverage, maybe a blitz you hadn't anticipated. But he's a creature of habit just like you are. And unless it just so totally devastates you and caught you off guard to where you can't deal with it, that thing will go by the wayside as you continue to get into the game. So what you have planned on during the week for the most part, is going to be what you're going to see in the game if you do your homework. Now, this is something you want to write down. I want you to look at these numbers, and I'm going to leave it up there a while, and I want you to take the time to run it down. Now, this is in the NFL. For the college game, the differences won't be worth mentioning. From the high school game, to be honest with you, I'm not sure how applicable the exact numbers are, but the ratios will be the same. In college football, in the NFL, and again, I've got more statistics to back this up than one man ought to, you're going you're gonna to be in a true first and 10 in the open field 20 to 25 times, OK? I'm not talking about earned first downs, which you look in the box score and see, OK, the Minnesota Vikings had 18 first downs. No, we had more than 18 downs. We earned 18 first downs. We had 10 series, so we had 28 first down opportunities. The run-pass ratio, you don't need to, to, you can put down if you want, but we'll talk about that as we get into it. A true second medium, I'm talking about second and two to five. You're going to be in open field now five times a game. Okay? Second and seven plus, 10 to 12. A true second and one to two in the open field once a game. Third and seven plus five, third and two to six, five, third and one, one. You can see the other numbers in here. This ratio in college ball comes down just a little bit. You schedule for a backed up series in college ball, you're there predictably at least once a game. In the NFL, it's about once every three games. Now, as you look at these numbers, use those as a guideline. Go back two, three years, whatever you've got data on. And if you can break it down, there's no reason, particularly with the age of computers now, and if you don't know how to work one, I guarantee you there's somebody on your staff that does, to use this to help keep track of yourself I promise you, you're going to find that your numbers, although the numbers may not be exactly the same, in college ball, you average about 72, 70, 72 snaps a game. In pro ball, it's about 60, 64 to 66. In high school game, I couldn't tell you. That's something that you. But the ratio of numbers are going to be the same. I promise you. Now, there's a margin of error. And yeah, there's a given game. Well, son of a gun, you come up and you were in third and one three times. But there's games you get in where you're not in a pure third and one. For the average, you're going to be in there one time a game. OK, now I want you to keep these numbers in mind, because I'm going to give you another one here <clears throat> that get at the heart of what I'm talking about. OK, am I, I'm in your way here. Now, what I'm going to talk about next is I'm going to put up a schematic. Now, if you take these numbers, and I'm getting at the heart of the magical 25 openers, how does Bill Walsh or anybody else come up with these magical 20 or 25 openers. The way I start my game planning, and this is certainly not to say it's the only way, not a way that you have to follow, but I'm not real smart. I'm limited intelligence, OK? I have to break things down as, as, as to a, a workable, manageable size as I can. So what I'm going to tend to do when I start a game plan is start condensed and work out. Too often, I think, you take an approach where here's the offense, here's the game plan. And then you try to whittle down as to what is going to be my specific call by situation. And I'm going to show you a way that we attack it that's had some success. And I can put this back up for you in a minute. I'm going to move on here. And I can put that back up for you, anybody that needs that. I'm going to show you the way I'm going to start my game planning on Monday and Tuesday with the coaches. And I'll have to move this over as we go. 
Let's take first down. You're going to be, I just told you, in first down in the open field 20 to 25 times a game. All right, let's take the first half. Divide that in half. For us math geniuses, obviously, we're talking 10 plays a half, 10 first down plays a half. When I first down, I'm, saying, I'm talking any first down base offense. Now, our approach is we want to be balanced on first down. Third and medium, third and long is no brainer. You know you've got to throw to get the yardage, particularly in the NFL. Defense knows that. I know the defense knows that. There's only so much you're going to do. Base offense, first and 10, second medium, are the only true downs that I have that I can approach a defense that I know I can dictate to him what he's going to do. Because he's not going to get a feel for me, and I can show you any number of years, in the last five years in particular, on first down, our run-pass ratio has never been greater than 45-55 on either side. So it's virtually 50-50, and that's not by happenstance. We work very hard to keep that ratio because that's the one down that I want the defense guessing. They're going to have to guess by personnel. They're going to have to guess by formation because I am equal-handed. Now, taking that equal-handed approach. Now, maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you want to throw on every down. That's your decision. That's fine. Those numbers are going to hold true. But if I want to be balanced, that means five runs and five passes. Now, if I want to be balanced, 50-50, it would go, common sense would say, well, I would like a couple of my passes to be play actions because obviously that should be a legitimate run threat if it's a 50-50 balance on first down. So I go into the game on first down in the first half. I'm going to run two play actions, two dropbacks, and one quick, meaning a three-step hitch, slant. I haven't been any place in any offense that at the end of the year we didn't decide, geez, I wish we'd have thrown some more three steps. I wish we'd have thrown some more quicks. They're efficient, cut down on sacks, quarterback's confident with it, get a lot of good yardage with it. Low risk, high percentage. So I'm going to go on on my first down. I'm going to have two play actions, two dropbacks, two quick. All right, second medium. I told you overall you're going to be in there five times a game. That means in the first half, let's take the upper end, you need three plays for the first half. Three plays for the first half for your second medium. Second medium obviously means if you've run the ball or passed it, particularly if you've run, you've gotten a good five yards. you got things going pretty good. If I'm going to have, in, in most situations, two runs and one pass, and that pass is going to be a play action. Now, maybe you're not running the ball that well. Maybe you need to have two passes and one run. Maybe you want to throw all three times. That's up to you. The ratio is up to you. I'm telling you over the long haul or over on a complete game, this is the ratio I want to based on what we're doing offensively. But the ratios are up to you. So I'm going to have two base runs. I'm going to have one play action. Now, second long, 10 to 12 times a game. OK? Because it's second long, we run about 30% of the time on second and seven plus. And that's about average in the NFL. Now, you may be 50-50. Again, the ratio is up to you. But if I'm going to do that, that means I'm going to have two base runs. I'm going to have one play action, and I may not get to that because a play action fake on second 10 is kind of a bogus fake unless it's maybe a fake draw. And when I put play action, that's probably what I'm going to do. I'm going to run a rock combination with a fake draw. Two drop backs and one quick because a quick slant or a quick hitch, depending upon what their coverage is, is a great way to get back some of the yardage on second and 10. Now, part and parcel with this, again, these are a lot of numbers, but second and 10, this is true of college, this is true of the NFL. Last year, we led the NFL, second in the NFL, in third down conversion, 44%. Now, how do you get to that? In the NFL, you're going to be in a third down approximately 200 times a year, OK? Of that third and one, I told you once a game in the open field, didn't you? OK, so that's 16 third and ones, and about half of many again in the red zone. So you're looking at the average of 25 true third and ones in the NFL out of that 200. You're going to be in a third and medium and a third and long across the board between five and six times a game. Okay, that's going to hold up, I promise you. Now, the numbers don't change that much in college. It's your job to figure out by what you run offensively, what your numbers tend to be the last two or three years or what you're doing. That's up to you. But they're going to be an identifiable number, and it's going to amaze you from year to year how consistent that is. It's going to flabbergast you that there's not going to be a margin of error of 5% across the board. Now, in second long, we have one priority for my quarterback. I have one priority in terms of what I'm trying to do here. I want to get to third and medium. Don't even think about getting the first down. 
quarterback, your job is to get in third and medium. Why? Because third and medium in the NFL, average to good teams, are going to convert between 50 and 60% of the time on third and two to six. When it jumps to third and seven and plus, a good team. Last year, the San Francisco 49ers led the NFL with a 30% conversion. The rest of us peons were down around 20%. Okay? That means if you're in it five times, like I told you, if you convert one in five, you're doing about average. Okay? Now, I've been to Vegas enough. I know what the house odds are. 60% versus 20%, I'll take the 60%. So what you script, don't get pissed off at the quarterback. If you got second and 10 and you're trying to get the first down and everything's down the field and you look down and you see that you're in third and 10, a whole hell of a lot more than you are third and medium. You can have a guy down the field you want, and that can be his first read, but the key is get me to third and medium. The play selection has to be geared towards that. The quarterback has to know what reads are get him to that situation, and your percentages go up dramatically. Okay? Third and medium, I told you five to five to six again. Okay? There again, if it's a true third and two or three, you might tend to run a trap or a draw or counter, which is what we tend to do. So that's what I'm going to script there. But for the most part, you're going to have the three passes. Again, if it's a short third and medium, a play action may have a place. But I'm going to have a play action, a drop back, and a quick. I'm going to start my game planning with the idea, after I look at all these snaps of third and medium, what's my best play action, what's my best drop back, what's my best quick. OK, third and long. Again, now the run fake is a little, obviously, a little less. I'm going to say three plays to the half. You might have the draw in there or whatever was in your third and medium. But for the most part, I'm going to have three drop back passes. And again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have two passes that put me down the field for the first half, for the first down. And I'm going to have one pass that the quarterback can identify that I've told him, if I call this play, you find the dump off. Because I'm going to take my chances that I can throw this thing for six yards, and my receiver can get two more. And that's what it's designed for. Because you're not going to live very long in the NFL thrown into the teeth of a zone defense on third and 10 when they're, everything they're doing is basing on keeping everything in front of you and keeping you short of the first down. Now, uh, third and one to two there again, I told you one per. I'm going to have two plays, because I'm going to take my third and one package in right from the get-go. I'm going to have two plays, my best third down run, and then I'm going to have a pass for each. And these will usually follow over from here. I may decide, since I've got quicks in my base package, that's always up. I can just pick one. My straight drop back would be a three receiver or four receiver. I don't care if he knows I'm going to throw for it. All I need is one or two yards. And my normal play action is going to come off a three tight end, bunched up, smash ball, first down. And I'll try to dick him at that point. And that will carry me for the entire game. Now, so what does that mean as we game plan? Let's add those up. I'm talking about base offense now, not red zone. Ten runs, five play action passes, five drop backs, and three quicks. Now, that's a workable number to me. Now, that ten runs in my base run don't mean they don't have to be ten different runs. I'm going to rely on my running back coach and my line coach to tell me what works against these guys. Coach, the zone play and the counter is going to kick the shit out of them. OK, let's put three zone plays up out of different formations and two different counters. OK, and we're also going to have a trap. And we'll also have the sweep. And we'll also have the whatever it may be. You may want 10 different plays. And I'm going to sequence those. OK, I'm going to label them 1 through 10. I'll show you my game plan here in a minute. And that's the order I'm going to take it in. Not only because that's the way we're going to teach it, but that's the way that the coaches know it's coming. They can specifically watch for what it is, whatever it is they're watching for, and now they can intelligently tell me, coach, you were going to run such and such, but do this instead. That also doesn't mean that if I gouge them for five yards a shot on the first two zone plays and the next play is a trap, that I'm not going to say, screw it. I'm going to come back to the zone play. Okay? That doesn't mean you don't have that kind of freedom, but at least it's an educated process. Now, you tell me out of an entire offense to come up with five play action passes, five drop backs, and three quicks, I can be pretty focused. What I'm normally going to do is connect these run formations with my play action passes as well, have one play off the other. So if I know I'm going to run a zone play at a two tight end spread and at a three wide explode double right spear, 
okay, and out of two backs, two wide outs, and a tight end, and go stem, split right, then I'm going to work my play actions off that as well. I'm going to work a play action off that zone series. I'm going to work a play action off the counter that my line coach thought was pretty good. And I'm going to run a play action off my trap. And now it's quickly identified. Now I've got my base offense. I know what we're going to open with. I'll script it the same way. And now knowing that I do have to play a second half here, we'll base that offense and, exp and expand it out from that initial focus that I had. Now, let me share with you a way that we'll approach it. <clears throat> Coach Green, all of his experiences with Coach Walsh, this is a typical game week for us. And what you'll see is very specific attention by periods to down and distance situation. On Wednesday, we'll have a walkthrough. That walkthrough will be a specific first and 10 and third and six plus, meaning third and long. You have your individual periods. You have periods that you work against yourself. The beauty of this system, and I don't expect you to incorporate totally this and, and change whatever you're doing, but it's something you need to consider. We have to in the NFL. You're going to have to in high school football and college football for a couple reasons. Men, the day is past, the old days, where you had unlimited numbers on scholarship. You had unlimited time. That's changed. They're cutting away at us with every passing hour. They're cutting away. In high schools, you all know that your numbers over the last 10 years have steadily shrunk, at least every state that I've been in. Some dramatic, some not so dramatic. When I was at Stanford University. Inner schools in San Francisco had to scrimp hard to get 15 and 20 guys to come out for football. Some of the suburbs, obviously, a little bit different. But with the numbers that you now have, even in college, the days where you can just say, OK, here's a prep defense, here's a prep offense, or offense, you go down, and you practice for an hour and get as many repetitions as you can, can't do it. You don't have the numbers, you don't have the time, and you've got to maintain the interest of your athletes as well. Coach Green runs our prep offense and defense. And he does that for two reasons. One, those guys respond a whole lot quicker to Coach Green than they do to me. You say, Chris Carter, come in here. You've got to run a play for the defense. He runs in there and runs it when it's the head man telling him to come over. The other thing is that does for Coach Green, it gives him a specific feel for analyzing what we think a team's going to do against us offensively and defensively. But you can see in these numbers, they're very specific in terms of down and distance by team. We did this exact same thing at Stanford University. We didn't have a prep team. It was offense against defense, typical period, like you can see up here, seven on seven. Defense gets six snaps of first and 10. Then offense gets six snaps of first and 10. Defense gets four snaps of third and five, or third and medium. Offense gets four snaps of third and five. Now what that did was meant you're going good on good. There was a great, the intensity was picked up because the head man's standing right there. Now the key to this, though, is you've got to be specific. You're not going to get umpteen numbers you just can't say, well, we got this play down because we took 40 snaps of it. There comes a point of diminishing returns. You all know that. How many times can you take the SAT before diminishing returns? They say between two and three times. The same, man, you can run a, a, a play five, six, seven times. And after that second or third time, there are diminishing returns. Now, given the numbers I've just given you, we have this board up in our office. It's, it's cemented, it's carved out onto our chest, or, on, or onto the, uh, one of the grease boards. This is the number of snaps, first down, base offensive snaps, I get a week against our defense. As I just wiped out the uh, microphone. OK? I get 15 snaps of walkthrough. I get 30 snaps of team. The darkened area is pads. We go in pads one day a week. Now, I'm not telling you to go pads one day a week. I'm not telling you to change your practice. I'm telling you to recognize how you practice and attach a specific number of plays that you can expect to get during the week. Now, what I'll do then in each of these situations, and there's the base offense, there's the red zone, nickel, short yardage, goal line, backed up. I know at the beginning of the week, that's how many snaps I'm going to get. So when we start out with our base offense, our five dropbacks, our five play actions, our quicks, I'll then sit down 
And we'll collectively, we'll fill this in. And we'll say, OK, the gut's going to be good, so we're going to cover it in walkthrough. This is this front. I'll make sure I get so many snaps of it versus team. I'll get some versus inside. I'll look up there and I'll tell the line coach, God damn it, man, you're practicing the trap in a walkthrough or a non-pilot practice. That's not the place to, we can practice zone in, in shorts. But you can't get a good look practicing the trap in shorts. So the traps are going to have a higher priority in our padded periods. OK? You can extrapolate that out to whatever you want, whether it's a particular coverage, whether it's a particular play that has a high priority. Everything we do goes on the computer. All of our scripts go into the computer. Thursday night, the first thing I do before I start looking to Friday is I'll look at a spit out of what we've practiced against what. And I guarantee you, for the longest time, I did that because I'd get, I'd get to it on Friday when I was in college game, and I'd look and I'd say, son of a bitch, we're going to run the gut as our number one play. Their number one defense is a 57 or over defense, and we didn't run the son of a bitch one time in practice against a defense. We ran it maybe in walkthrough. Maybe we did it against each other, or we did it against a semi-live period, but against a reactive live defense, I actually didn't get it run. Now whose fault is that if it doesn't work? The players or yours? And by having it all up on the board in front of us, you have a complete view of what's being run and in what ratios and against what. That doesn't mean it's locked in stone. You can't change it. But we know what we're going into the game plan with because we've started here and worked bigger and fit it into the game plan. The other thing this does is you start to realize, well, geez, I can't get this one play practiced. Where do I fit it in? I don't want to give up on this. I don't want to give up on that. Well, then you've got to ask yourself, well, do I really need this? If I don't want to give up this snap on here or that snap there, just thinking I can add a couple minutes extra to practice or throw it into the game plan, and all of a sudden it's going to be run effectively, it doesn't happen, man. Whatever your ratio is, and you have the same practices. You're like everybody. Your Tuesday practice consists of such and such with so many snaps. Even if you don't go offense versus defense and you do a 40 or an hour period against a prep defense, you still get a countable number of snaps. Decide what it is you want done, what the ratio should be, and that's the way you should practice it. Now I'll show you my game plan. And this is on a 8 by 14 card. The coaches on it are on the same. You can see my openers. I got my 10 runs. That's what the darkened area was. And I've got my 10 passes, my play actions, my dropbacks, my quicks, in the order I want to run them. OK? In the runs, if I'm going to, what I'll start up here is if I'm going to start with the zone, and then the counter and the trap by formation, the corresponding, corresponding passes usually go with the idea that I've run this run first or I've run that pass first. And that doesn't mean you can't jump around or it's not time to reach down and grab something else. But by having that feel for it, and the players get the same list. They know the order I want to call this. And there again, they get into a rhythm. They get into a feel for what's being called. And as you move down the field and you're successful with it, it breeds a great deal of confidence, because they know what's coming, and they know it's kicking their ass. Second down, three runs may come directly out of here, may be different. My base passes. My second medium passes, that's going to be the two play actions and the, and the quick. Okay? Or whatever ratio you decide on. Short yardage, the true second one, which you'll be in once a game. You decide before the game. Is this a good enough team? And it's going to be that close. And I've been opened up as the coordinator at Utah State against Nebraska three times, man. Now you talk about a mismatch. And you think about, well, what can I do to make a difference in this game? Because game time, I believe in my heart that we could beat them. But in the cool calm of the offseason, I can admit to you right now, we won't get our ass kicked, and we did. But if it's a team like Nebraska, second one, I got no business running just to get the first down. I got to make something happen. So this week, I decide second one's got to be a big play. I'm going to throw it down the field. I'm going to run a, a trick em. OK? Whatever it is, whatever your mentality is, identify it, have a specific play. The players know it's coming. They've practiced it. They know the situation. The quarterback can probably call it without even you sending it in, and it's got a higher success ratio than if you don't. The third medium, I break it down to third and two to three, the little bit longer third and four to six, the true third and two, which
which is some kind of, I call it short, that might be something that is just long enough that I want to give the appearance of a run and I'll sprint out, let the quarterback run for it and drop it off. And these things get filled in very quickly during the week. My game plan, every script for the entire week, our players come in on Monday, short run around, I look at film, uh, players don't come in on Tuesday, all day I'm looking at film, putting the game plan together, meeting with the coaches. By Tuesday night, the game plan, this board, is filled out, done. Every scripted play for the entire week is done. The cards are drawn up, okay? If this is done, then this is mostly done. I know the order that's going to fill into. And I step it piece by piece. I put it together. By the end of the week, this thing's filled out totally. And now you might move it around and say, yeah, we weren't running this quite as well as I'd like, so I'm going to drop this down, and I'm going to make this a little higher up. And you move it around. But now everybody's got a feel for where the game plan's coming down. The coaches know the sequencing that you're coming up with. Everybody's got their assignment. Everybody knows what's being run, the players included, and they have a great deal more confidence with it. Okay. I'll take it one step further. In training camp, this is the thing coaches told me when I went into the NFL, oh boy, you, wait till you find the difference between college training camp and pro training camp. I'm here to tell you there's no difference at all. Just like you, how many practices did you get before your first game in high school? Anybody? From the minute your training camp started, your preseason, to your first league game. Isn't there, isn't there a set? High school, you're allowed so many practices. 20, 25 practices is what it used to be. In college, they very much put parameters on it. You're going to end up between 20 and 25 practices. In the NFL, between training camp opening and our first preseason game, now we get preseason games, but it's still a game, we have between 20 and 25 practices. It all equates to the same. We took the exact same approach at Stanford that gave us 20 practices before our first opener, and we take the same pro, uh, practice with the Minnesota Vikings, and if you look at these numbers, they'll have some interesting ratios. I told you you're going to be in a third medium and third long approximately five times a game over 16 games. That equates out to about 70 to 80 plays. You can see over these, in this instance, 18 practices, a total of third medium and third long, I get 68 and 66 snaps equally. And based on the total percentage of the plays that I can practice against an active defense in those 20 practices, the ratio comes out the same as it does in the game plan. That's not by accident. So you can take it even that far if you want to. And you know the easy part? You want to know what to practice? OK? You got, what, 10 games in high school? I just told you five third mediums. That's 50 third mediums. Go back, take the list. It's probably on your self-scout, your computer self-scout. That's where mine is. I'll take my 50-some-odd to equate it to what you're doing. 50-some-odd third mediums. That's what I'm going to run next year, man. It's what you ran last year. It's what you ran the year before and the year before that. We're all creatures of habit. Now I'm going to take that list of 50. I'm going to say, this wasn't good. Th this series wasn't good. This series was. So I'm going to run a little more of this series. And I think this is good because I went to some clinic, and that self-righteous son of a bitch from Minnesota convinced me that we're going to run the Dodge. So I'm going to start running this Dodge series that we're going to talk about tonight. But now it's a prescribed play. This is what I'm going into, third medium. Now, during my 20 practices of preseason, how many snaps am I going to devote to third medium? So which of these am I going to practice? Now you've got it. Now, boom, it falls right into place. Now you come to game week, and you're preparing for the third medium part of your offensive game plan. You've got the list. Take the five you want. Take the five best. You can break it down any way you want. These are good against two. These are good versus two man. These are good against man. And take out, it's already done. The amount of time it will save you during the week and the confidence you'll go in with it is unbelievable. At least it has been for me. It makes a world of difference. OK? Now, let me recap for you. I'm going to go over a little bit. I'm going to put some film on for you here. I'm going to put that one more schematic up just to make sure you all got it. And don't take my word for it. If you don't have a computer, get one. 
you're all at schools, I guarantee you, sitting, there's 50 of them sitting in some class, and one of your coaches, I guarantee, knows how to turn it on. It's not that complex. Because I promise you, it will help you stay more organized, consolidate what you're doing, and you can come up with these same numbers. And if you want to take, if you haven't already, you probably already have it at your disposal to go back over the last couple seasons, look at how many times you're in a given situation and what you did, and see how repetitive it is, and plug these numbers in yourself and see how accurate. They may not be exactly right, but for you and the style of offense you're running, there's going to be carryover, and it's going to be the same. It might be a little difference because these are my numbers. College and pro, like I told you, I promise you, you can go to 28 pro teams, and I won't be off by 5%. OK, let me show you a sequence in a game. I'll turn this back on for you in a minute. I think this goes on if I don't blow us up here. This is against our Kansas City Chief game. It's the opening 10, just like I told you. You knew I was going to pick a perfect example. We had exactly 10 first down opportunities in the first half against Kansas City. What we ran and how we ran it isn't as important, important. Oh, let me shove that tape in. That would help. I just want you to see the sequencing. I want you to watch what plays are being run, if you can, what ratios, and look at the similarities in formation. OK. OK, we call this explode trips right. This is the first first down game of the uh, first first down sequence of the game. They don't all work. Explode, vice right whiz, opened with a toss. OK, got a couple yards, not great. But I'm not fired yet anyway. OK, same kind of little action. Start with the trips. Explode out into it into a double. It started out looking like the formation you just saw initially. And we're running a three-step. We call this option 10 hitch or option 10 seam. Fades on the outside. Inside receiver doesn't do a very good job, but that's beside the point. Here's my quick. I told you on first down I was going to have one three-step scripted up on first down. Bounce spread formation. Run a tackle trap here, ends up bouncing outside. We're a big trapping team. OK. So we've run an out, a toss. We've run a trap. We've run a three-step. We've run some OK, just a straight lead play down in here in the red zone. Bear with me with this. OK, there's another one of my base runs. OK, we're back to a spread. That's the formation we ran uh, that uh, tackle trap out of. So now, again, I've packaged a base run. Now I'm going to have a drop back out of it. Or excuse me, that comes up later on. We run this just straight zone out of it as well. OK, so we run the zone play from that formation. OK, I'm back into that spread formation again. Could be any formation this week. We just happened to feel like spread was going to be good. So I had a trap, a tackle trap, a zone play. Here's a waggle or a play action. Here's the play action version of it. There again, I told you on first down, we were going to have two forms of play action on first down. Based it off a of formation that we had two other runs built in off of. OK, here's that formation you saw earlier with the three-step drop. We started with the one formation we started the game with. We explode out of it. We're in the formation we ran the quick off of. And now we run the trap. The fact that we ran the trap isn't that big a deal. The fact that we ran out of that mo uh, formation isn't that big a deal. The fact that we were able to package together in our openers and our first down makes a difference. Here's the formation we ran that lead play out of, short motion to tight end. And now we have a play action off that same I lead principle. Doesn't work. But the important point is you're getting a feel of how we're packaging by design that first down offense that says we're going to have five runs and five passes on first down in the first half. What are the base runs? Here's, another, here's the dipsy doodle. I, was, uh, I tell you, I'm terrible 
at calling these in the game, but beforehand, the players beg, coach, we've practiced this son of a bitch all year long. Let's get it run. I said, okay, we get the ball inside the 40-yard line on a first down. First chance it comes up, we're going to uncork it. Tony's did a great, Tony's did a defense did a great job of getting us the ball. So we came up, the score is 10 to 3 or 10 to nothing at this point. We ran a double play action reverse fake, laid up a corner to Chris, great catch, touchdown. Now I promise you, I wouldn't have called that if I hadn't listed it in my openers, because that's not my nature. Okay, we're back to the formation, that spread formation. Ran the outside gut again. Now we're back to the point in the script where a couple things have worked. So whatever scripted up, if it feels good, I will. If not, geez, that, that spread trap or that spread, that, that time I exploded to a three wide uh, trap, hit pretty good. I'm going to come back to that. Boom. Come back to it again. Doesn't mean you have to go exactly by the script that it takes away your free agency to do, do those things that feels good or that you feel like you've got confidence in. But from this film, again, the main thing I want to show you is a sense of the inner relationship between formations, personnel, and plays along the ratios that we talked about. OK, this, the, the Dodge stuff we'll get into tonight. Let me pop this out. OK, I'm going to put this up one more time. Last chance. Oh, okay. Well, I'll keep you going. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, that would be, if, if anybody's got any, now I realize this is a lot of shit I've thrown at you guys, and it sounds very sanctimonious that this is guaranteed and that, and this works that. And, and like I was saying, don't take this as specific gospel to what you do. Push it back up. What I'm telling you is, take the concept of rationed, ratioed offense, to what you do, take the time in the off season to examine what it is you do, what you've had success with, extrapolate it into an entire game plan with extreme specificness, okay? And you can see with these numbers, I know right now the initial reaction is, well, how, how can you handcuff me that way? How can, how can you know it's going to come out laid out exactly in that order? Or how can you s limit yourself to just this number of plays? How can I go in with only five plays or second medium? Well, yeah, you go in with, with five, maybe six, whatever you're comfortable with. But go back and look at what you practiced. Take, if you keep such records, and you should, look at what you practiced. Pick a game out. Look at everything that you practiced. Look at what you ran. There should be about 10 to 15 to 20 percent overage. That's okay. That's going to happen. But what you're going to find for the most part is the number of snaps that you have, there's going to be closer to 30 or 40 percent overage. There's going to be 30 to 40 percent of what you've practiced during the week that you don't get to in a game. That's not being fair to your athletes. You owe them more to be a little extra time, a little extra analysis, and determine what it is you're going to do by situation and practice it that way.